Hi, my name is Pat Adams, a spiritual director and blogger about the spiritual life. The consuming interest of my life has been this, how do I, how do we live a life centered in God? And yet deeper still, who am I really? What is my purpose? How do I connect deeply with God? These are the questions I will address in this video series. God doesn't wrestle us to the ground, or bop us over the head, or force us to follow His ways. He is much more subtle than that. He dangles invitations in front of us throughout our whole lives that start and end with our deepest desires. Through a quiet voice within us, He is whispering, Come and smell the roses. Look at that beauty. Do the thing you've always wanted to do. Or the invitations might be around a religion. Find a church. Read the Bible. Find your purpose. Find out who I am. In our day-to-day -day world, these soft voices within are easily forgotten in all the busyness in our lives. I don't have time to do that. Or I'd never do that. What would others say? Or they're drowned out by our very noisy minds. These voices that were constellated in our childhoods as we try to make sense of this world and our part in it. These old voices that form our repetitive mind's offerings are major drivers of our behavior throughout our lives until we can get a handle on the source of our behavior that is counterproductive and culturally driven. Why do we do what we do? Why do I have to be so careful with this? Or why am I always so defensive about that? Or why do I project my stuff onto others and forget to see them as they are, not as I think they are? These are the questions that help us get down to the basic drivers of our behavior, which got set in our childhood and are rarely appropriate to us adults. Until we can disconnect from the emotional hold these have on us, we will not be free to pursue our own created purpose. We are so beholden to the cultural sense of who we are, we have no idea who and what we were designed to be by God. Spiritual practices of meditation and contemplation are so difficult at first because our repetitive minds won't stop spinning. But the payoff is so freeing as we learn to step back from the mind's influence and begin to see the thinking for what it is, a very old way of looking at ourselves and what we have to do. We become an observer of our thoughts, no longer reacting emotionally to them. We can name the source of each of the voices, moms and dads, grandparents, aunts and uncles maybe, siblings and more. We see that we're still trying to make up for the negative feedback we got as kids. <laughs> I don't think they ever go away. I was very hopeful for a while that if I kept working on them, they disappear. But they seem to be a permanent part of us. The good news is that they fade away to mere background noise when they no longer upset us emotionally anymore. And as their influence over us calms down, we begin to hear the invitations that God holds out to us all our lives, that still small voice within. These are seeds He is sowing in us, hoping that they will find fertile ground, take root and sprout, invitations to step into a life that leads to the kingdom of God. There are several parables about seeds in the gospel. In the parable of the sower, the man is spreading seed over many different kinds of soil, rocky, thorny, and good soil. And when the seed fall on good soil, they produce a crop, maybe a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. So it is in us. We are open to the invitation or the seed dies. If we're open to the invitation from God, then there is the promise that our listening to and then doing what is suggested will produce many times what was sown. The parable of the mustard seed continues this theme. 
The mustard is the tiniest of seeds and yet it can produce a tree so that the birds come and perch on its branches. Again, we see the emphasis on how what is sown in us by God can grow exponentially within us if, and it's a big if, we are open to the invitation. It doesn't seem to matter that the good seed grows up among the weeds. Jesus cautions against trying to pull up the weeds lest some of the good seed get destroyed too. Best to wait until both are ready to harvest, when it will be easy to distinguish between the two. And in the parable of the growing seed, Jesus suggests that the farmer has no idea how the seed sprouts and grows. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel. The whole process is a mystery, and so it is in us. When we begin to listen to the indwelling Spirit of God, we only notice the changes in us. We are not so much aware of the process by which it happens. In our creation, God has already prepared the soil. Connection to the indwelling spirit is built into our DNA. All we have to do is begin to listen to his call and to do what it suggests. And then Jesus tells us that we will be blessed. Your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. It doesn't matter if you're sitting in a church every Sunday and haven't said yes yet to the indwelling spirit of God. Or if you're an agnostic or non-believer or just plain indifferent to religion. The process is the same for all of us. Say yes to what God is softly calling you to and do what he proposes. Then keep listening and doing what is suggested again and again. What God connects us to is our created purpose, fulfillment, love, and more. So the more we pay attention to his voice within, the more we're going to find ourselves in a process of self-discovery of the deeper, truer self, the unconditioned self, the soul. The question that informs our days is more like this. What do I really want to do? than this, what should I be doing? That goes on throughout our days for this task, for this day, for this life. What do I really want to do? Heeding the invitations leads to an adventurous life in which much pain and suffering is healed and much richness and creativity is revealed. And since we're aligning ourselves with who we were created to be, much of the work we do is effortless. It's the way we were designed to be. This, of course, requires a lot of trust in the sower, which is built up along the way. What I have found is that the process is self-affirming, that is, affirming of the deeper self, the soul. So every step of the way is revealing what the soul, the shy, I'll only come forward by invitation, soul has in mind for our life. And I believe that the soul and God are communicating the same thing. Perhaps it's because the soul holds the Lord's agenda for us until we're ready to realize it. And what might that agenda be for each of us? I have no idea because we were each created uniquely. Each soul's agenda would be different. However, I do believe that there is only one task all of us are asked to complete each of us using our own gifts and talents and what we've learned from our challenges to usher in the kingdom of God here on this earth. Following our own soul's agenda leads us to love and to demonstrate that love where we are, in the work we do, to the people we meet, to our family and friends. In other words, we are each to be a beacon of light in this dark world. And where might you be in answering God's quiet invitations? If, as I believe, they are everywhere we are and go, if he is issuing them to us constantly, then we have to ask ourselves, am I even hearing the invitations? Do I brush off their suggestions as not possible? Have I answered even one of them? Am I poised to hear the invitation from God? 
Am I willing to step outside the cultural paradigm and take the first steps to an integrated, fulfilled life? These are important questions for us 21st century folk. In the extreme busyness of our lives today, are you hankering for a quieter, more fulfilled, meaningful life? Do you wish you could get off the treadmill and go at your own pace? Is the work you're doing meaningful to you? What is your soul calling you to? Will you pay the price of stepping out on your own, supported by God, in order to gain the freedom to be who you really are? I know there are many obstacles, obligations, families, timing, etc. to overcome. But if you're living a life described by Shakespeare like this in Macbeth, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death, you might think twice when the next invitation comes along. I can assure you it won't be long if you pay attention. And if you continue to listen, every detail and every obligation will be taken care of in the midst of what is a sea change in our lives. All I can say is that it's well worth the journey to a more interesting, more grounded existence, a more fulfilled and purposeful life, a life that uses the native talents that you have plus all of your life experience particularly what you've learned from the challenges you faced, a life so engaging and compelling that you will wonder why it took you so long to say yes. I think that it's mostly during midlife that we're willing to listen to God's invitations because by that time, everything that the culture has taught us about how to be in this world really begins to break down. And so we're open to a whole new way of thinking about ourselves and our lives. And then we can freely choose to listen to the still, small voice and do what it suggests. Thank you for watching. I look forward to hearing from you soon.